The danger of a fallen angel could actually kill you. And what we find on the streets of Jerusalem. And the Big Bang is in big trouble. All of this and more coming up next on the Quick Study program as we go through the Bible in one year. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. And this is the Quick Study television radio program. Glad you decided to join us today. Special hello to those who are listening on radio around the world. Now, today as we continue to go through the Bible, and in a moment you'll see the pocket guide that comes up, which is a daily Bible commentary that is married to this program. We'll tell you how you can get it later on. But we're going to be focusing today on 1 Corinthians 15 to 16. We're coming up to the end of this letter. I want to talk about the danger of the fallen angel and his fallen angels. If you're not careful, you could be killed. Uh, I'm not just talking about spiritually, but also physically and with your purpose in life. It's going to be very interesting. All right, Corey, we have Bible archaeology coming up, which is? We are going to be taking a look at some final resting places, tombs. Oh, very good. Tombs. Excellent. Uh, all right, we're going to be talking about that. Plus, we have Cosmic Mysteries mm -hmm. Online. What's up? Well, we're talking about the most commonly accepted theory in the world right now, known as the Big Bang Theory. And amazingly, even, even with all its problems, many still buy into this idea. Well, today we're going to take a look at just one of the many problems that riddles the Big Bang Theory. Uh, just because the Big Bang Theory has problems does not mean there wasn't a beginning. There was a beginning to mm -hmm. the universe, but the question is how and how do we know? Well, who was there? Well, we'll find out all of that and more coming up a little bit later on in our Cosmic Mysteries segment. Let's study on. Get your Quick Study Pocket Guide. Go through the Bible with us. Write P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. We are viewer supported, and if you'd be kind enough to pray about what God would have you do, remember we are supported by gifts from people just like you. Again, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Corinthians chapter 15 is really interesting because it's all about resurrection from the dead, spiritual and bodily resurrection from the dead. Now this was a hot topic in the ancient world. First it was a hot topic among uh, the different sects of Jewish believers, among the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and we see that play out in the Gospels. And uh, we see Paul use that in the book of Acts. When, when he's uh, in trouble, he needs to distract them, and so he's like, I'm being held against my will because of my belief in the resurrection from the dead and uh, and the factions just freak out because it's a hot topic but this also becomes a hot topic in the Christian church because there were those of more Gnostic beliefs that came in and said well Jesus really didn't rise from the dead physically he just rose from the dead spiritually and so there's this difference you see between the spiritual world and the physical world they can be completely separate um, so it's interesting to read this and understand what's going on what we're gonna talk about right now is the place where Christ did physically physically resurrect from the dead. While there is no definite proof that the garden tomb is the site of Jesus' burial and resurrection, there are striking similarities between the site and the gospel narratives. It is known that the garden tomb was located in a privately owned working vineyard. The presence of a large cistern indicates that it was owned by a wealthy individual. The tomb itself is cut out of solid rock. Originally, the door of the tomb was half the size we see it today, matching with the Gospels' accounts of having to stoop down to see inside. The body would have been laid on the bench or couch in the far right wall of the tomb corresponding with Mark's observation of looking in and to the right to see where Jesus' body once was laid. 
Also convincing is the site of this garden tomb's Golgotha. The base of the cliff face was a known place of stoning and execution. Its location near the Damascus Road and Gate offered plenty of exposure to condemn rebellion. Traditionally, the prophet Jeremiah was also imprisoned in a nearby cistern and stoned outside the same Damascus Gate. Now, the ancient city of Corinth would have known many strange doctrines and religions, but like the Greek philosophers in Athens that Paul meets in Acts 17, they would have been unfamiliar with the idea of the resurrection from the dead by Jesus Christ. So Paul reiterates the gospel message and its power to the church to recenter their thinking upon the very reason they're there. Chapter 16 continues explaining about life after death and moves to Paul's final farewell message and his plans. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Uh, James chapter 4 reminds us of where wars and fights come from. Uh, he says, do they not come from your own pleasures that lust and desire within you? Talking to the church. Well, today, the dragon, the fallen one, Satan, will always attempt to reset our minds with the weight of human nature in our faith walk. Satan wants us to get involved in fights and divisions and our own lust argue over the gifts of the Spirit, uh, create divisions in the church. Why? Because the fallen angel, Satan, is fearful of the gospel. The changing power of Jesus Christ cannot be put down. In fact, it will put down those who invest themselves in Satan's kingdom. And so Paul, at the close of his first letter to Corinth, reminds the church why they are there. They are there to demonstrate and present in their lives the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it must be proclaimed in that very decadent culture of first century Corinth. And I want you to think about this because we live in a time where there is great love of self. We live in a time when our new idol is in the mirror, when it's all about us and we propagate self-esteem. Our entire problems are self-esteem. So we, we must learn to worship ourselves. This couldn't be any further from the truth in the Bible. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses one and two, Paul says this to the church. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received and in which you stand, by which you were saved. If you hold fast to that word which I preach to you, 
unless you believed it in vain. Now here is the first truth to live by. Paul is explaining to us that the fallen angel will always try to distract us from our first calling, the proclamation of the gospel. Now how does he do that? Well, one way he does it is by making us distracted with our own self, our own lust and our own desires. You see, let me tell you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ begins this way. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Me, you, all of us are not good enough to get to heaven. Wow, that sounds depressing. That's politically incorrect. It won't fly on the Oprah Winfrey Network. They would never air that on the comedy channel. It doesn't make you laugh, but it's the gospel. That's how it begins. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then it continues. And God so loved the world. That you and me, God loves us. We might hate him, but he loves us. That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Paul says to us in the church, remember the gospel. The gospel isn't that you're great and you're amazing and you just should be worshiped. But the gospel is that we have all fallen, but Jesus who is great has lifted us up. Paul continues in verse 5, he says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Verse 4 says, And that he was buried and rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Verse 5 says, And that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. Verse 6, And after that he was seen by over 500 brethren all at once, of whom the greater remain to this present day. But some have fallen asleep, some have passed away. Verse 7, after that he was seen by James and then by the apostles. Verse 8, and then least of all he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. In other words, on the road to Damascus. So this brings us to the truth to live by number two. The believer's biblical faith is a response to historical truth and matters of fact. How do we know the gospel is true? We know the gospel is true because the gospel works. I'll tell you right now. I mean, when you take guys like Paul who are killing people in the church, you take guys like Peter who is denying Christ, and all of a sudden he gives his life for Christ, I mean to tell you, the gospel works. I met an archaeologist, a dear friend of mine, Dr. Gary Byers, and he said to me, I said, Gary, what is the most amazing piece of archaeological evidence for the gospel? And you know what he said to me? He said, I work in a rehab center. And it's the alcoholic who's freed. It's the drug addict who is delivered in the name of Jesus. He said, I've dug in the ground all these relics. But he said, it is the archaeology of the human soul where I see the gospel more effective than anywhere else. Paul goes on to say in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. Verse 10 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached and you believed. Now, beloved, here is truth to live by number three. The testimonies of changed men and women, like Saul to Paul, is irrefutable evidence of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You do not have to go back in time and fight over the rocks. I mean, if they would have found the body of Jesus Christ, there'd be no argument today. The church wouldn't be here. In fact, the entire church and all of its history rests on one simple fact, one profound fact, one universal shaking the galaxy fact. Jesus is risen. And because of that, the gospel of Jesus Christ changes lives. Like yours, like mine. You can talk about the great secret power of the universe. You can call out to it and ask for your Ferraris and your big houses all day long. But when it comes down to a soul who needs a transformation, a marriage that needs to be healed, a man or a woman who needs to be loved, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that's there. Stay on the gospel.
In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we see evidence that the church center is still in the city of Jerusalem. Now that's not surprising because Jerusalem has been the center for a very long time, ever since David captured it from the Jebusites many hundreds of thousands of years ago at that point in history. So what you and I are going to do right now is we're going to explore the streets of Jerusalem and underneath the streets of Jerusalem and also talk a little bit about the history of the city that you may not be be aware of. We're going to track it through the Bible and add on to that some archaeology and historical research as well. So take a look at Jerusalem. Although the physical archaeological record of early Jerusalem is still relatively quiet, we are able to glean rich hints and information from historically contemporary sources, like the Amarna letters. These let us know that Jerusalem, called Jebus, was an important, royal, fortified city before the days of King David. 2 Samuel records how David and his army commander Joab enter this fortified city by sneaking in through a sort of water access shaft, or tunnel. Until recently, archaeologists believed that they had found that very shaft in what they call the Warren's shaft. Now they are reassessing, but the conquering via water shaft is not in question. Archaeology has shown it probable and realistic. Exciting and controversial are the excavations still going on underneath and around the Temple Mount complex. Archaeologists working here are smack dab in the middle of King Solomon's original handiwork. Underground chambers, walkways, ritual baths for Israel's priests, and even possible connection passageways to the royal palace. An underground stable and holding pen for animals was found near the edge of the Temple Mount complex. Unfortunately, this has since been destroyed by Vandals of History. Join Janice, Corey, and Rod Hembry live every Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. for the Bible Investigators Program. We take your questions from Facebook, from Twitter, and also from the chat room about God, the Bible, and the church. Study for Truth with God's Word, Sunday nights live at Bible Investigators. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com, 8.30 p.m. Eastern on Bible Investigators. Join us. In the dictionary, the word faith is defined as confidence or trust in a person or a thing. A belief that is not based on proof, yet will be substantiated by fact. But is this faith? Is faith just a spiritual word for luck? Or is faith nothing more than a New Age term, destiny? The Bible calls faith substance and a real thing, not a mystical belief. Faith in God's ability to act and react in your life has been deeply abused by non-biblical teaching and the ideas of man in our present culture. But now we invite you to join Rod Hembry as he explores and searches out the real power and meaning of real faith in God's power and authority. This is a special audio CD and a DVD Bible study on The Essence of Faith with Rod Hembry. These two discs, one for audio listening in the car and the other is a DVD for watching interactive Bible studies, are available to you for a gift of $20 or more. To reserve your copy of The Essence of Faith, a Bible study on the faith in God's power, write or call today. Write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, or P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. Immediate downloads are available for giving on the internet at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Hear a lot of people talk about the word gospel. Well, the word gospel is an Anglo-Saxon word that actually means God's spell. 
Now, in some ancient renderings of the Anglo-Saxon, it means entering the God spell or the good spell. It was a kind of supernatural intimation uh, to this particular word in, in a good way, not a bad way. So the idea was that a spell was good and powerful and that spell came from God. The ancient Greek, the word gospel, is a very interesting word, euango lion, which means, and pardon my Greek, which means it is where the word evangelism comes from and seems to come from. So the word gospel means good and great news or a good spell coming from a faraway place. And so we use gospel to say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not die but have everlasting life. God descended in the form of Jesus Christ uh, through Mary, being born of the virgin, fully in the flesh. He was the goodness of God come to earth. He was and is the God spell, the good God spell. So very, very interesting. That's what we mean when we're talking about the gospel. All right, we have Cosmic Mysteries now coming up. Ryan, what yeah. are you talking about today? Well, the most commonly accepted model of our origin is called the Big Bang Theory. It's the most commonly accepted idea, but yet the problems, the problems it faces are so numerous that they could not all be talked about in this 30-minute show. So we're just going to take a look at one. It's called the Baryon Number Problem. The Big Bang Theory is the naturalistic attempt to explain the origin of the universe. In this scenario, the entire universe starts out as an infinitely small and infinitely hot point, called a singularity. This point then expands rapidly and the energy cools down as it is dispersed. This energy then becomes matter in the form of hydrogen and helium. It is then from these gases that everything comes together and condenses into stars and galaxies. This is the most commonly accepted theory of our origin in our day and age, and yet nearly every step is riddled with problems. In fact, the number of problems with this model are so great that they could not nearly all be covered here. We will therefore just look at one of the problems involving the conversion of energy to matter. It is called the Baryon Number Problem. This is the issue of missing antimatter. To state it simply, if the Big Bang were true, then it should have created antimatter. Antimatter is a substance like ordinary matter, only with the charge of the particles reversed. Ordinary matter has a proton which is positively charged and has an electron which is negatively charged. Antimatter has an antiproton which is negatively charged and an anti-electron also called a positron which is positively charged. It is also important to note here that a proton is also called a baryon. The baryon number problem is not an issue of whether or not energy can be changed into matter. After all, energy can be converted into matter in a laboratory. But the issue is that when these changes occur, they always produce an equal amount of antimatter. As far as we know, matter cannot be created from energy without creating an exactly equal amount of antimatter. To sum it all up, if the Big Bang actually did happen, then it would have also produced equal amounts of antimatter. However, the universe contains virtually none. With the estimated number of atoms in the universe being a 1 followed by 80 zeros, this is no small imbalance. Big Bang believers realize just how big of a problem this is and have been forced to come up with an idea to try and save this naturalistic scenario. They've proposed that on rare occasions, energy can produce matter without any antimatter. This, of course, is based on speculation and has never once been observed. Secular physicists continue to speculate to try and solve this problem, even though observational science has shown us that when matter is created, there is always an equal amount of antimatter. While a lack of antibaryons plagues the Big Bang model, it is actually a very important design feature for biblical creation. This is because when baryons and antibaryons touch, they actually destroy each other and release large amounts of dangerous radiation. The fact that matter exists without an equal amount of antimatter is a testimony to the supernatural design of the universe and goes in accordance with the Bible. Isaiah 45.18 says, God formed the earth to be inhabited. Of course, Ryan, what I like about Cosmic Mysteries is I'm a bit of a Star Trek fan, and uh, they always use these terms, you know? Like, I remember <laughs> yeah. the Baryon Sweep, mm -hmm, you know, in yeah. Star Trek The Next Generation. Well, now, through Cosmic Mysteries, I understand what that is. Uh, <laughs> it's not a sweep, it's a number. I got it, I got yeah, it. I have to admit, I'm a Star Trek fan, too. Big Star and, Trek fan. And, but, you know, uh, to, to be able to see the science of God and know that the science of God is not competing uh, with the evidence that we do see, 
to realize that it's all about how you interpret the facts uh, is very, very important. That's mm -hmm. one of the things you're going to be talking about. But yeah. we have this, uh, this coming up in 2012. Before we get to that, there's more. Yeah, there is. We have another science fact for you today, which is what? Well, the sun is more than 100 times the diameter of the Earth, and the star Betelgeuse is about 600 times the diameter of our sun. If Betelgeuse was placed at the center of our solar system, the inner planets would be completely overtaken. Wow, that's one big star. <laughs> that's huge. Big and that's star. not even the biggest star. No, it's true. That's intense. When you realize, and when you, uh, we saw the, we were at the Creation Museum uh, mm -hmm. down in uh, near Cincinnati in Kentucky from Answers in Genesis. What a great Creation Museum. And mm -hmm. we encourage people, go there. You need to go there and spend some time there. It's interesting. We watched the planetarium about the different variations of the stars. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you the truth. By the time I was crying, <laughs> uh, I mean, I was, I was like, tears were coming down my face. It's, God is so big. Yeah, it's very humbling. And I was thinking, you know, my little problem, God did all this, and I'm worried about my little problem. I mean, God was good. When I've got the guy who made all these stars helping me, I mean, wow. Anyway, mm -hmm. listen, 2012, we have Space Fridays coming on Quick Study. You're going to enjoy it. It's going to happen in 2012. Also, remember our Bible Guide, all new material. We're going to be focusing on the energy of God's Word in your life. And I believe it's based on Isaiah 55. We're going to go through the Bible again. All new material, brand new Bible discovery letter. Ryan and Corey will have articles in it. Make sure you become a partner. It was the winter of 1979, and I had the house keys, but my parents took off to go eat dinner. I was the only one home, and I went outside the house and locked myself out. And I was like knocking on the door. Now think about that. Why would I knock on the door? Nobody was home. I thought maybe the dog would learn how to turn the doorknob. It didn't. The dog didn't learn how to turn the doorknob. And it reminded me of that scripture. He stands at the door of your heart and knocks. You're home and you can answer if you decide. I do not want to let this half hour go by without reminding you that there is only one way to heaven according to the Bible. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Who? Jesus Christ. That's right, Jesus Christ. And if you believe that he died on the cross and rose again and there's something in your soul calling you today, that's, that's him knocking on the door. And if you say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I want to make you Lord of my life. I do believe. He will come in and your life will be different. What happens after we die? Do we walk towards the light or is it just like static? This and more on Bible Investigators, Death and Dying, What Happens Life After Death. You can only see this on BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Click on Bible Investigators for all the topical Bible studies.